Hello everybody, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Gil Kalai from the Hebrew University and Reichman University. And it is a pleasure to introduce Isabella Novik. Isabella Novik is famous for her, her deep works in algebraic combinatorics and geometric combinatorics, and in particular, the study of convex polyphors. Uh, Novik is, is known for her work on face numbers of manifolds, her studies of neighborly, centrally symmetric polytopes and spheres, balanced polytopes and spheres, and manifold, and connection with commutative algebra and with rigidity. Isabella Novik excelled in mathematics as a child in St. Petersburg, and later she studied at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. She is now the Robert R. and Elaine F. Phelps Professor of Mathematics at the University of Washington, which is, for those of you who don't know, the mecca of the study of convex polytopes and discrete geometry for uh, many decades. Novik is the recipient of the Netanyahu Prize and the fellow of the American Mathematical Society. Although it is four o'clock uh, at night, now in uh, Seattle, Washington, Redmond, Washington, uh, Isabella will be happy to answer questions on Discord. Uh, so the floor is uh, yours, Isabella. Hello. It's a great honor and pleasure to give this talk. In the talk, I will try to share with you bits of the exciting theory of face numbers. I'll concentrate on their upper bound type results. Let me start by introducing the, one of the main players of this talk, the notion of a polytope. A polytope is defined as the convex hull of finitely many points in RD. Equivalently, and in a dual way, we can define a polytope as a bounded intersection of also finitely many closed half spaces in RD. Here are some examples of polytopes in R3. Let me concentrate for a second on this one. It's called a simplex. So in general, a simplex is the convex hull of affinely independent points. Before you move on, let me add that polytopes are studied and have, have applications not only in combinatorics and discrete geometry, but also in other areas of math, such as analysis, algebraic geometry, optimization, statistics, and others. Another thing before we move on is that we can define the dimension of a polytope as the dimension of its affine hull. In particular, all of those polytopes are three-dimensional. I am a combinatorialist, so I like to count. In this talk, we are going to count faces. A face of a polytope is defined as the intersection of our polytope with any supporting hyperplane. What is a supporting hyperplane? It's a hyperplane that has all points of the polytope on the same side of a hyperplane. So for instance, imagine a horizontal plane in this example that passes through this point. This horizontal plane is a supporting hyperplane, and so it shows that this point is a face. It's not hard to see that a face of any polytope is by itself a polytope. So we can call, talk about faces of dimension i, and we're going to refer to them as i faces. Zero faces are usually known as vertices, one faces as edges. If our polytope is d-dimensional, then it's d minus 1 faces are known as facets. It's a theorem that every polytope has finitely many faces, in particular, finitely many i faces. Let's denote this number by f sub i. We usually arrange those numbers in a vector, which we call the f vector of our polytope. So in this example, we have a three-dimensional polytope it has six vertices, 12 edges, and eight facets of two-dimensional faces. And we'll see this polytope again in 
the remainder of the talk. One of the central motivations for this talk comes from the upper bound problem. It asks the following question. Let's look at three parameters. I for the dimension of our face, D for the dimension of our polytop, and N for the number of vertices. So the question is, what is the largest number of I faces that a D-dimensional polytope with N vertices can have? We want that answer to be a function of I, G, and N. We mentioned that in a dual form, this question has connection to optimization. In the dual form, it asks if we consider a D-dimensional polytope defined by n linear constraints, what's the largest number of faces of each dimension it can have? In particular, what's the largest number of vertices? It seems that one potential approach to this problem might be to try to come up with polytopes that have many faces. And this leads us to the notion of the cyclic polytopes that were discovered and rediscovered by many people, including Carfadori. Gill and Motskin. So what are the cyclic polytopes? Let's start with fixing D and looking at the D moment curve. It's a function that takes a real number T to a point in RD whose coordinates are powers of T. So T, T squared, T cube, all the way to T to the D. For instance, on D is 2, the moment curve is just the usual parabola. Now, fix, pick any n distinct real numbers, for instance, 1, 2, up to n will do. Order them from smallest to largest. Look at the images of these real numbers on the moment curve. They have n points in RT. Take the convex hull. By definition, it's a polytope. We will call it the cyclic polytope and denote it by C of D. We can wonder where TIs disappear from, why TIs disappear from our notation. It will become clear on the next slide. So we claim that these polytopes have some nice, very nice properties. Let's start discussing some of them. So let's start with simpler properties. So it turns out that this polytope is full dimensional, D dimensional. It has n vertices, so every point we started with is a vertex. It's simplicial, meaning that all of its facets are simplices. Now, uh, what can we say about faces of this polytope? So specifically, we are interested in a combinatorial type of the polytope, meaning we know which indices of those TIs, which of those TIs form vertex sets of faces. And it turns out that this combinatorial type is completely independent of the choice of the TIs. In fact, there is a beautiful complete characterization due to Gale, known as Gale's evenness criterion, that completely characterizes the vertex sets of facets of the cyclic polytopes in terms of the gaps between indices of those vertices. Continuing discussing phases of this polytope, here is perhaps the most amazing property that this polytope has. It's half of D neighbor. What does that mean? That means that every set of up to half of D vertices forms the vertex set of a phase. Well, so if D is free, half of D rounded down, is one, so that just means that every point we started with is a vertex, which brings us to the first brutal point. It's not that exciting. But already on D is four, half of D is two. So this property tells us that every two vertices of this polytope are connected by an edge. Then D is six, not ev only every two vertices are connected by an edge, but every three form the vertex set of a two phase. So in short, in the first half of dimensions, this polytope has tremendously many faces. Every subset of our vertex set of cardinality i 
as long as i is less or equal than half of d, every such subset gives us an i minus one dimensional phase. So the total number of i minus one phases is n choose i. It's the largest possible number of phases any polytope can have. And so this hints that hopefully in the upper half of dimensions, this polytope also has a lot of faces. We will come back to this point in a couple of minutes, but first let's slightly dig digress and talk about simplicial complexes. All complexes in this stock will be finite, so let's fix a finite set V, which we'll call the vertex set. Then a simplicial complex on V is any collection of subsets of V that satisfies a couple of restrictions. Must be closed under inclusion, that's the main property. It's also usually convenient to assume that every single term is a face. Some terminology, the elements of V are called vertices, the elements of delta are called faces. So a face is just a finite set, we can count its size, we say that f is an i face if the size of f is i plus 1. As in the case of polytops, we denote the number of i faces by f sub i. Why plus 1 and why i simplicial complex is relevant to this thought? That's because we can think of them in terms of pictures of that form. Such pictures are called geometric realization of our simplicial complex. So to obtain a geometric realization, you basically associate with each vertex of delta a certain point in a high dimensional Euclidean space. You choose those points generically. And you associate with each abstract simplex, so a subset of V, the convex hull of the corresponding points in your high dimensional Euclidean space. It's a geometric simplex and they're nicely glued along, so the intersections are convex hulls of small dimensional faces. So we get pictures of that form because Euclidean space has topology, that topology in, induces topology on our geometric realizations, and so we can talk about topological properties of our complexes. For instance, we will say that delta is a simplicial sphere if its geometric realization is homeomorphic to a sphere. And we will say that it's a simplicial manifold if its geometric realization is homeomorphic to a closed manifold. With these definitions in hand, we can now talk about upper bound problems and theorems. The first upper bound conjecture in this series was proposed by Motskin in 57. And it says that among all d-dimensional polytopes with n vertices, the cyclic polytope simultaneously maximizes all phase numbers. While this conjecture is stated for general polytopes, it's not hard to see that to prove it, it's enough to work with simplicial polytopes. Now, the boundary of every simplicial polytope is a simplicial sphere. Victor Klee introduced a huge class of simplicial complexes that he called Eulerian complexes as a combinatorial analog of a notion of a sphere. While I'm not going to define this class for you, I'll mention that this class contains all simplicial spheres, and in particular, all boundaries of simplicial polytops. It also contains all simplicial odd dimensional manifolds. It also contains all simplicial even dimensional manifolds, as long as their Euler characteristic is two. It contains other complexes as well. So Klee proved that if the if you take any t minus one dimensional Eulerian complex with n vertices, as long as n is sufficiently large and roughly d squared is enough, so he proved that this Eulerian complex satisfies the inequalities of the upper bound theorem. And he conjectured that the restriction on the number of vertices being sufficiently large can be dropped. So he conjectured that among all Eulerian complexes of dimension d minus 1 with n vertices, 
the boundary complex of the cyclic polytope still simultaneously maximizes all the phase numbers. Now, in this generality, the conjecture is still wide open. However, we now know some results. Let me share some of them with you. The first result is due to Peter McMullen from 1970. So he proved that the upper bound conjecture does indeed hold for all polytons. His result was extended by Richard Stanley to the class of all simplicial spheres. We now also know that the upper bound conjecture holds for all on dimensional simplicial manifolds and also for all even dimensional simplicial manifolds as long as they have Euler characteristic too. Well, I don't have time to tell you the proofs, but let me at least mention some ideas. McMullen's proof used shallability of polytopes. So it's known that every polytope is shallable, meaning that its facets can be arranged in a certain nice way that allows for induction. Unfortunately, most of simplicial spheres are not shallable. And so to extend McMullen's result to simplicial spheres, some new techniques had to be developed. In particular, Stanley and independently, Hoxter and Riesner, who was at the time Hoxter's student, developed the theory of what is now called as known as face rings or Stanley Riesner rings. And in particular, Stanley's proof of the upper bound theorem relies on Reasoner's theorem that the face ring of any simplicial sphere is a coin Macaulay ring. And so that's one part of the proof, and our part uses properties of coin Macaulay rings. What do we do with simplicial manifolds? Unfortunately, in general, face rings of simplicial manifolds are not coin Macaulay. However, they satisfy a certain weaker property known as bugs bombness. And bugs bomb rings are also quite extensively studied. So the proof for manifolds depends on studying properties of bugs bomb rings. Let me also mention that the cyclic polytope in the statement of the upper bound theorem can be replaced with any half of D neighborly D polytope with n vertices, or any d minus one sphere, simplicial d minus one sphere with n vertices. This leads us to the question of how rare, how common this property of being neighborly is. And that's what we will address next. But first, let's spend a couple of minutes by discussing the total number of spheres and the total number of polytopes. Let's denote by C of dn, C stands for convex, the number of simplicial D polytopes with n vertices. And let's denote by S of dn, the number of simplicial D minus 1 spheres with n vertices. And D is free. It follows from the celebrated Steinitz sphere that every two-dimensional sphere can be realized as the boundary of three-dimensional polytope. And so those two numbers are equal. However, already on D is 4, surprises start happening. And so in chart, the picture looks like that. The class of polytopes, simplicial polytopes, forms a tiny, tiny fraction of the class of all simplicial spheres. So to state the, the results precisely, let me mention the, these two very beautiful theorems, one about the number of polytopes, and another one is about the number of spheres. So by work of Goodman, Pollock, and follow-up work of Fallon, we now know precise order, asymptotic order of the expression C of D. So it turns out that this, the number of polytopes, D polytopes with n vertices, is roughly on the order of 2 to the power of n log n. So, in short, there are very few polytopes. On the other hand, there are lots and lots of simplicial spheres. And so, the results I am about to state comes from a sequence of papers by different groups of people, 
So best known to date, lower bound on S of GN is from the paper by Neboa, Santos, and Wilson. Okay, so this result says that they don't know precise asymptotic behavior of S of GN, but we almost know. So we know that it's squeezed between the following two expressions. So on one hand, it's at least as large as roughly 2 to the power of n to the power of half of g. And on the other hand, it's at most as large as almost the same expression, except for an additional log n in the exponent. We mentioned that the upper bound is actually an easy consequence of Stanley's upper bound theorem we discussed a couple of minutes ago. The lower bound relies on genius uh, constructions. Most of those constructions are actually based, perhaps surprisingly, on the subcomplexes of the cyclic polytope. Just to see how those expressions behave, let's look at an example when d is 4. So already in that case, we immediately see that s of 4n is at least as large as roughly 2 to the power of n square, and at most as large as 2 to the power of n square log n. So 2 to the power of n square is, of course, much, much larger than 2 to the power of n log n. So there are many, many more simplicial spheres than polytopes. Okay, so what proportion of polytopes are half of d neighborly? What proportion of spheres are half of d neighborly? What can conjecture that there is only one half of d neighborly polytope with arbitrary large number of vertices, the cyclic polytope? His conjecture was quickly disproved. And in fact, Schemmer introduced technique knowing, known as the sawing construction, and he used it to produce a lot of neighborly polytopes. This construction was generalized and extended by Padrol, who was able to construct even more half of the neighborly polytopes. And so the results of Schemmer and Padrol indicate that most of polytopes are half of the neighbor. To be more precise, they constructed on the order of 2 to the power of n log n half of the neighborly simplicial g polytopes with n vertices. And if you remember, that's also the order of the total number of simplicial polytopes, d polytopes with n vertices. In fact, Padrol's constructions of highly neighborly d polytopes provide today the best lower bound not only on the number of half of d neighborly d polytopes, but on the total, it's currently the best known bound on the total number of d-dimensional polytopes with n vertices. So they suggest that most of polytopes are neighborly. In fact, Padrol was able to extend this construction to also construct many spheres that are not realizable as the boundaries of convex polytopes, because those spheres come from non-realizable oriented metroids, so he was able to construct many more than such polytopes and spheres, many more meaning different constant in the exponent, yet asymptotically this number of spheres is still on the order of 2 to the power of n log n. On the other hand, we just saw on the previous slide that there are many more simplicial spheres than this expression, so the question remains open. Can as of this slide, can we actually have construct many more highly neighborly simplicial spheres? And again, to be more precise, let's denote by Sn of d n the number of half of d neighborly simplicial d minus one spheres with n vertices. Motivated by results of Schemmer, Gil Kolai proposed the following conjecture. He conjectured that if we fix d, that's at least 4, and we let the number of vertices go to infinity, then the ratio between log of the number of neighborly spheres to the log of the total number of spheres approaches 1. 
This conjecture is still wide open. However, about a year ago, with Heilun Zheng, we were able to make some progress. So we were able to construct many neighborly spheres. So here is our result. For all d starting with 5, so we still don't know what to do with d equals to 4. So for all d starting with 5 and up, we constructed at least on the order of 2 to the power of n to the power of half of d minus 1 over 2 half of d neighborly simplicial d minus 1 spheres with n vertices. And for comparison, let's recall from the previous slide that the total number of spheres is bounded from, is bounded, is at least as large as something on the order of 2 to the power of n to the power of half of d. So as you can see, our exponent still doesn't really exactly match this exponent. So hopefully there is a way to construct even more highly neighborly spheres. Okay, so let's summarize what we saw so far. We saw that the moment g becomes 4 or up, uh, there are many more simplicial spheres than simplicial polytopes. Nonetheless, those two classes satisfy exactly the same upper bound sphere. And even some manifolds satisfy the same upper bound sphere. In fact, let me very briefly share with you some very exciting news. So it follows from works of very recent works of Adi Prashita and Popalakis and Petrato that, in fact, not just the upper bound theorem is the same. In fact, the n factors of simplicial d minus 1 spheres, the set, coincide with the set of vectors of simplicial d polytons. But returning back to the upper bound theorem, so those two classes satisfy the same upper bound theorem, and the maximizers are given by half of d-neighborly g polytopes and half of d-neighborly simply show d minus one spheres. We also saw that there are plenty of half of d-neighborly polytopes, and there are plenty of half of d-neighborly spheres. So that. What, that's what happens in the class of polytopes and spheres without any symmetry assumptions. Now let's switch gears a little bit and introduce some symmetry into play. So in the rest of the talk, we are going to discuss polytopes and spheres with central symmetry. Well, a polytope is called centrally symmetric if it's symmetric about the origin. So if each point X contains point minus x. We would like to mimic that definition and define central symmetric simplicial spheres. So we'll say that a simplicial sphere is central symmetric if it has a free involution. So in a little bit more details, delta is central symmetric if there exists a map on the vertex set of delta that takes, that induces simplicial map on delta, so it takes a phase to a phase. It's an involution, so if we apply it twice, we get the same phase we started with back. And it's a free involution. So every time we apply it to a, just once, to a non-empty phase, we must get a phase that's different from the phase we started with. So here are some examples. Here is a cross polytope. It's centrally symmetric. So whenever we have a centrally symmetric polytope, we can look at its boundary complex. It's a simplicial sphere. And we can take this antipodal map and try to use it as our involution. And you can easily check that all the conditions are satisfied. So this does give us a centrally symmetric sphere. On the other hand, here we have a one-dimensional sphere realized as a pentagon. Let's consider the involution that switches A and A prime, so maps A to A prime, A prime to A, maps B to B prime, B prime to B, and maps C to itself. This is not central symmetry 
for a couple of reasons. First of all, case C is fixed under that evolution, which is not allowed. A more subtle reason is that the edge, A, A prime, is also fixed under that evolution because A is mapped to A prime and A prime to A, and that's not allowed. In general, it's good to have in mind that if we do have a central symmetric simplicial sphere, then for any vertex V, V and its image, so a pair of antipodal vertices, are never connected by an edge because if they were connected by an edge, then that edge would be fixed under our involution, and that's not allowed. Okay, so we would like to understand what restrictions being centrally symmetric imposes on the F factors. More specifically, we would like to understand the upper bound type results. What is the largest number of I faces that the central symmetric G polytope with N vertices can have? What is the largest number of I faces that the central symmetric G minus one dimensional simplicial sphere with N vertices can have? In addition to intrinsic interest, an additional motivation for this problem comes from an observation by Donoha and his collaborators, and also by Rudelson and Rushinian. So this observation says that if we can produce central symmetric polytopes with many faces, then the existence of such polytopes would have implications in the theory of error correcting codes. Okay, so let's start by trying to find polytopes, central symmetric polytopes with many faces. And thinking about what we saw in the class of polytopes and spheres without symmetry assumption, it seems that one approach is to try to find, to define and find highly neighborly centrally symmetric polytopes. Well, unfortunately, in the central symmetric polytope, a vertex and its antipodal one never, are never connected by an edge. But that seems to be the only obstacle. So let's adjust the notion of neighborliness and say that the central symmetric sphere is CS K neighborly. If every set of K vertices does form the vertex set of a face, as long as it avoids this obstacle, as long as it doesn't contain a vertex in its action. So notice that the central symmetric sphere always has an even number of vertices, and the number for G, central symmetric G polytope must have at least two G vertices. So the vertex smallest polytope, central symmetric polytope, is the cross polytope, which is just the convex hull of the endpoints of the standard basis and their antipodes. So here is our old friend, octahedron, three dimensional cross polytope. It's very easy to check that this polytope is even CS G neighbor. Now, what happens as we increase the number of vertices? Next possible number of vertices is 2G plus 2. And McMullen, McMullen and Shepard produced the following polytope that they proved is CS half of G neighbor. So they started with the cross polytope and then they added a pair of antipodal points the sum of the standard vectors of the standard basis and its antipode. So this polytope is central symmetric and they show that it's CS half of G neighbor. Well, what happens if we keep increasing the number of vertices? How neighborly can a central symmetric polytope be? Thinking about what we discussed in the world without symmetry assumption, we might hope that the answer is half of G. However, it became clear already in the late 60s that the neighborliness of central symmetric polytopes is rather mysterious and rather restricted. So in particular, the following result in the case of G equals four is due to Grunbaum. For higher dimensional G values of D, it's due to McMullen Shepard. So what they proved is that a central symmetric G polytope with 2G plus 4 or more vertices can never be half of G neighborly in the central symmetric sense. In fact, it cannot be even CS 
g plus 1 over pre plus 1 label. So plugging in g equals 4 and this expression, we see that a central symmetric 4 polytope with 12 vertices already cannot be even CS2 neighbor. Now, D can be arbitrarily large, so D over 2 or D plus 1 over 3 can, it's also can be a huge number. However, it is a result of Burton that for an arbitrary D, a centrally symmetric D polytope with a sufficiently large number, and sufficiently large in his case is about half of D to the power of half of D, so such a polytope already cannot be CS2 neighbor. So let me spend the next couple of minutes talking a little bit more in detail about CS2 neighborliness, because after all, G to the power of D is an awfully large number. Can we improve the bound? What is the largest number of vertices that the central symmetric polytope can have and be two neighborly? turns out that now we know this result at least up to a factor of two. So it's a joint result with Matulineal from several years back that any centrally symmetric d-dimensional polytope that has already two to the d or more vertices already cannot be CS2 neighbor. Now proof is based on the volume argument that goes back to Dancer Grunbaum and even before that back to Minkowski. On the other hand, it turns out that there is a construction of a CS d-dimensional polytope with about 2 to the power of d minus 1 vertices that gives us a CS2 neighborly polytope. And this construction starts from the vertices of d minus 1 dimensional cube. There are 2 to the power of d minus 1 of them, and it perturbs those vertices using the d dimension in a certain way. And so now we know that the number of vertices that I see at, that the central symmetric G polytope can have and still be too neighborly lies in that interval. We do not know the exact values, although the, our knowledge for small dimensions suggests that the exact value is closer to the lower bound of that interval. Okay, but we would like to talk about phase numbers. The fact that a central symmetric polytope with large number of vertices cannot be even too neighborly already tells us that something about the number of edges. So let's denote by f max of d at one the maximum possible number of edges that a central symmetric d dimensional polytope with m vertices can have. So non to neighborliness implies that this number is strictly smaller than n choose 2 minus n over 2, at least then n is large enough. But can it be actually how much smaller? Can it be quite close to that expression? What in general can we say about this number? So there, there, are some, there is some good news and some bad news. So the bad news is that even the d is 4, the are very far from understanding this number. We don't know what the maximum number of edges that a centrally symmetric four-dimensional polytope effect vertices can have. However, we do have some bounds on that number. So for simplicity, let's assume that D is even. So it turns out that in the maximum possible number of edges, we always lose at least a certain constant fraction of edges. So that number can never be more than one or minus one over two to the d times n squared to two over two. This result is proved in a joint work with Sasha Barvenak, and it appeals to the same volume trick that I mentioned a couple of slides back. On the other hand, it turns out that there do exist central symmetric polytopes where we lose a fraction of edges that's not that much larger than this one. So that's a construction from a joint work with Barvin, Ock, and Sinjin Lee. It says that for every even d, where there do exist centrally symmetric d-dimensional polytopes 
that have on the order of 1 minus 1 over square root of 3 to the power of g times n choose 2 edges. When g is 4, we can slightly improve the lower bound. We can say that the maximum possible number of edges is squeezed somewhere between 3 quarters and 15 sixteenths of n choose 2. But as you can see, we are very far from being able to state even a plausible upper bound conjecture for central symmetric polytopes, because even the problem of the number of edges for four-dimensional polytopes, central symmetric polytopes, is still wide open. Okay, <laughs> so then let's switch gears a little bit and talk about the much larger class of central symmetric spheres. What can we say about the upper bound problem here? Perhaps by enlarging the class, we have a better luck of being able to answer the question. Now, if you think by analogy with the class of polytopes and spheres without the symmetry assumption, going to a large class of CS spheres should not help. But the following observation of Ronald Dean and Richard Stanley shows that if somehow we can construct highly neighborly, if highly neighborly central symmetric simplicial spheres do exist, then we are in a very good shape. So they observed that in exact analogy with what happens in the class of simplicial spheres without symmetry assumption, in the class of central symmetric simplicial d minus one spheres with n vertices, a central symmetric half of d neighborly simplicial sphere would simultaneously maximize all the phase numbers with a caveat, assuming such a sphere exists. So does it exist? Let's spend the rest of the talk discussing this question. There were some hints that it might exist. For instance, as I already mentioned, Grunbaum proved that no centrally symmetric four dimensional polytope with 12 vertices can be CS to neighborly. Yet, at, almost at the same time, he was able to construct centrally symmetric simplicial free sphere with 12 vertices that were CS to neighborly. A real breakthrough came in 1995 when Jokos solved this problem in dimension three. He showed that for every even number of vertices, starting with eight and up, there does exist a centrally symmetric simplicial three sphere with that many vertices that is CS to neighbor. A couple of years later, Frank Lutz, with computer help, found a few higher dimensional examples that were also highly neighborly, more neighborly than any centrally symmetric polytope of that dimension with that number of vertices can be. So does such a sphere exist? Turns out it does. And this result is from also from a joint work with Hailun Zhen from a couple of years ago. So we succeeded to extend Jokos's construction to any dimension. So what we proved is that for every D, starting with 4 and up, there does exist a C as D minus 1 dimensional sphere with an arbitrary large even number of vertices that is C as half of D neighbor. And in fact, right now, we have at least two non-isomorphic constructions. And we expect that there are at least exponentially many non-isomorphic constructions. But the upshot of this result is that together with the theorem of Adin and Stanley that I mentioned, we now have the upper bound theorem for CS spheres. We now know that among all central symmetric simplicial D minus one spheres with two M vertices, this particular sphere or any CS half of D neighborly sphere simultaneously maximizes all the phase numbers. So my time is almost up. So let me, in the remaining minute, very briefly summarize what we saw in this talk and re-emphasize some of the open problems. We discussed the upper bound problems for phase numbers of spheres and polytops 
with and without symmetry assumption. We saw that in the class of polytops and spheres without symmetry. Those classes satisfy exactly the same upper bound theorem. So spheres and polytops, the F factor doesn't see the difference between spheres and polytops, at least as the upper bound theorem is concerned. On the other hand, we saw that the situation for centrally symmetric spheres and centrally symmetric polytops is drastically different. The upper bound problem for centrally symmetric simplicial spheres is now completely resolved. On the other hand, for centrally symmetric polytops, they don't even have a plausible conjecture. And they don't even know what is the maximum possible number of edges that a centrally symmetric four polytop with a given number of vertices can have. And of course, there are many more remaining problems and mysteries, but let me stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Isabella, for this uh, wonderful talk. Uh, if you have questions for Isabella, please uh, uh, ask them on Discord, and uh, uh, we will add. Uh, we will end our uh, session uh, now.